Good morning, everyone, and grace to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm excited to be here this morning to share with you what the Lord has laid on my heart, and that is knowing the will of God. Uh, This last week, even as Herman already shared, the things that are going on in our country are disturbing, and I've been wondering myself, what do I do? How do I get involved? Do I get involved? And so this question has been going through my mind itself. How do I know the will of God in this situation that we're in right now? And so I'm hoping that Canada wakes up. I think most of us have realized that the media is portraying a very false narrative. And as Christians, we need to be aware of these things. We need to be aware that there is an agenda out there. And we're called to be wise as serpents, yet to be harmless as doves. And so these are just some things that I've been struggling with myself this last week as I want to know how to be involved. Just thinking even back, you know, what would we have done in the 1940s? We all say today we would have stood up against Hitler and what was going on there. But they were under the same pressure we're under today. Do you want to stay by and stay quiet and not get involved? Do we need to get involved? The Bible doesn't say a clear answer, do something or do nothing. And so, as we go through this lesson this morning or this message, I hope we come to a place where we can at least find the answers on what we should do and what we should not do. And so when it comes to knowing the will of God, there are two, definite, two different definitions in the Bible. There is the will of God, which is known as the will of decree or God's sovereign will. That's the will of God that doesn't matter what we do, we cannot thwart it. It's going to come to pass, no matter what we do. The will of God that will come to pass. For instance, in Matthew 26, 39, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, verse 39, And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father... If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. It was the will of God that Christ would die for the sin of the world. There was no other way that salvation could come into this world as, or besides going through Jesus Christ, Him dying on the cross. It was the decreed will of God. The men that nailed Christ to the cross were going to do so. It was predetermined by the will of God that He would die on the cross We find that confirmed in Acts 4.27, where the apostles were arrested. They were before the council. They were told to stop preaching the name of Christ. And afterwards, they're let go. And they have a prayer meeting in Acts chapter chapter 4. In verse 27 says, For truly this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So the leaders, the Gentiles, Herod, Pilate, they were doing exactly what God had predetermined would happen. They were, in the will of, they were doing the will of God against the will of God, so to say. They were living, or contrary to the will of God, performing the will of God. And so there is a will of God, it doesn't matter what happens, it will come to pass. It is known as God's sovereign will. There's nothing man can do to stop it. We know that the day is coming where this world will be judged. This world will end one day, everything will pass away, but not His word. That's predetermined and that's a guarantee it's going to happen. It is the will of God that it will happen. The second will of God is the will of command. And this morning we're going to focus on the second one, not on the first one. Just so we know there are two different wills of God. When we read the scriptures, it's important to understand what will of God is, ta- what is God talking about here? What is the Bible talking about when it talks about the will of God? Is it the sovereign will of God that God has decreed and it will come to pass? Or is he talking about the will of God that he wants us to do? And Peter, he says, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That is not a sovereign will of God that he makes sure that everybody comes repentance. It is the will of command. He wants everyone to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we know that not everyone does that. So the will of command 
you and I have the ability to refuse it. We can do it or we can disobey. We can fail to obey the command. But the decree will of God, that one we cannot thwart in any way. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And so, when it comes to the will of God, the spoken will of God, that's what we want to focus on this morning. And at its basic, it is the will of God that we would come to faith in Jesus Christ. So this morning, if there's anyone here who is not yet born again, you're not in the will of God. It is the will of God that you would come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I would implore you this morning, if you are not born again, before you go home, talk to someone. Ask someone, what does it mean to be born again? And there are more than enough people who would be willing to share with you this morning here how you can be born again, what the Bible tells us we, must, we need to do to be born again. So the first of all, the will of God is that we would come to faith in Jesus Christ, that we put our hope in the finished work of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it's going to be our text for this morning. Romans 12, verse 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The aim of Romans Chapter 12, 1 and 2 here is that our whole life will become a spiritual worship. That as we live our life, that everything we do would be worship to the Lord. I know with the culture we have, when we think of worship, we, uh, we think of music very often. There's a whole genre called worship music. But God doesn't want us just to worship when there's music. That everything that we do in our lives ought to be out of worship to the Lord. That means using our hands, our hearts, our bodies. Everything is to express worship toward the Lord and how much we appreciate what He's done for us. Those of us who are born again understand the value Christ is to us because without Christ we are nothing and we are destined for destruction. Romans 6.13 says, Do not present your members to sin as instruments to unrighteousness or for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been bought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. To offer our bodies as instruments of righteousness is a way that we worship the Lord. When you go home, the places that you go to, the things that you allow yourself to see, the things that you think about, are they a worship to the Lord? The things that you talk with people when you're done the church service, are they pleasing to the Lord? Everything Paul here is telling us that our members are to be presented to the Lord. So whatever we're doing, is it for the Lord or is it for myself? Or is it for just for the sake of talking even? There is a way to live as a Christian that would honor the Lord. There is a way to love. There's a way to love our friends. There's a way to love our brothers in Christ. There's a way to love our spouses. There is a way to love our enemies. There's a way to love this country. There's a way to act out everything that we do that would be a form of worship to the Lord, that would point to the Lord. There's even a way to do your job that's a form of worship. And so Paul here tells us that we are to be a living sacrifice. And I'm just thinking of an Old Testament example that illustrates this really well, what it means to be a living sacrifice. It's Genesis chapter 22, 1 through 24. We're not going to read that, but talking about Isaac. As, Isaac. as Abraham was asked to offer up Isaac, his son, on the altar of sacrifice, 
You can only imagine the conversation that must have happened as they were going. At one point, the Bible tells us there that Isaac looks at Abraham, his father, and says, we have the wood, we have the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham tells Isaac that God will provide a sacrifice. And the story goes on. Doesn't tell us many details, but we see later on that Isaac is on the altar. And so I know I've imagined myself at times somewhere in, the, in that journey Abraham told Isaac what was going on. Abraham didn't drug Isaac so that he would go on the altar. Isaac willingly lay down on the altar. He had a conversation with him and says, God wants me to sacrifice you. I don't know why, but God has asked me to do a sacrifice. And so Isaac, we see yielding himself to this, and he lays down on the altar as Abraham is going to sacrifice him, fully yielding himself to the will of God, as God had instructed Abraham to do so. And as he's about to slay him, we know the story. The angel of God comes and appears and says, Stop. And there's a ram. And they sacrifice that. But Isaac willingly put himself on the altar of sacrifice. And Isaac willingly put himself on the altar and would have died in obedience to the will of God. But the Lord sent a ram and took his place. And it says, Isaac, just the same, he died to self and willingly yielded himself to the will of God. So when Isaac got off, he was a living sacrifice. Isaac completely gave up his will and gave it into his, to the hands of his father, Abraham, who was walking with the Lord. And so when we think of being a living sacrifice, as we read in Romans there, it's someone who's yielded his body completely, who does not have his own interests, says, you know what? As you will, I will. Not as I will. Isaac was young. I think he was 16 at the time, and he would have had dreams and ambition. And so we think of his own interests he would have had, and he gave all that up to his father Abraham, trusting that God was doing something. And so that's what it, just a picture of what it means to be a living sacrifice and so, going to Romans there, we want to have a spirit of discerning, of discerning what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable. It requires for us to give up a self-right first. The verb also in Romans there that says present means once and for all. Not today if I feel like it and maybe next week when I feel like it. Present our bodies once and for all to the Lord as a living sacrifice. It's the same word that is used in marriage when a bride and a groom give their wedding vows. I give the right to my body away. It is no longer my right. I don't have right over my body. It's my spouse's right. When we give ourselves as a living sacrifice, as Romans there says, we give right, the right of our bodies away to the Lord and says, Lord, what would you have me do? How would you have me live? And so to be a living sacrifice and to be a worshiping person requires us to give up of our own right. We know that a person who is in Christ is already a new creation. So we don't need to be renewed every time. We are a new creation, but our mind needs to be renewed. Just like those of us who've had children... When they're young, they need to be trained and taught what to do, what not to do. They need to be walked beside. And so it is with a Christian who's new, a newborn Christian. Paul says we need our minds renewed, transformed. And the same thing, it takes time. It takes training, discipline. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man or if anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things become new. They are a new creation, but we need to renew our minds as we walk with the Lord. When we look at the world around us, the world wants to control our minds. The world wants to tell us how to think. Or not even just how to think, what to think. When you think of the universities or schools that we go to, they all tell you this is what to think. 
Not how to think, but this is what you should think. When we look at the media, even as I said before, we know that they have an agenda. And they tell us how to perceive things. And so when we think of the world system, it tells us what to think. But when we look at what the Word of God it says, it transforms our mind, teaches us how to think, not what to think. If you want to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 24. Paul here tells the Ephesians, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Once you're born again, Paul tells us, don't walk the way you did before. No longer walk in the futility of the mind, as the Gentiles do. They are darkened, it says in verse 18, in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They are darkened in their understanding. When you share your faith with people, they don't understand. Right? They don't understand. Why would you believe that? The Bible says they're dark in their understanding due to the hardness of their hearts. 19 says they've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, to greed, to practice every kind of impurity. But, verse 19 or verse 20, this is not the way we've learned Christ. Those of us who are in Christ, it's not how we came to know Jesus Christ. Meaning this is not how Jesus is. It says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. It says, verse 22 says, to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The battle is always on the mind. The battle starts in the mind. The victory is won in the mind. If the mind gives in, the flesh follows. And so when we want to have a renewed mind and we are not yielding to the Lord, it does not happen. Verse 24 says, And put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and in holiness. We're to put these things on. It's an action word. It doesn't happen by itself. You're in Christ. You are a new creation. You are secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. He keeps you. But to have a renewed mind requires action on our part. You want to know the will of God? It requires us to have a relationship with the Lord. It requires us to be in the Word of God, to have our mind renewed. So when we think of the stuff that's going on around us, what does the Lord want us to do? How do we engage? Jesus said that we should be in the world, but not of the world. And Scripture teaches that the church is to be a light and is to hold the, even our government accountable. We're to hold everyone accountable to the standards of God. We are here representing Jesus Christ. We are His ambassadors to show forth a righteousness. So the world wants to control your mind, but God wants to transform and renew it. Uh, God transforms our minds and makes us spiritually minded by using His Word. As we spend time meditating on God's Word, memorizing it, and making it part of the inner man, God would gradually make our minds new, renew our minds spiritually. If you want to have a renewed mind, renewed mind, it's required that we spend time in the Word of God. It's required that we pray with the Lord, that we're in fellowship with the Lord. Colossians 3, 11, or 3, 1 through 11 says, If you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Set your mind on things above as you live your life. There are many things that are around us that are constantly drawing, calling for our attention. You have a job, we have a house, we have cars, we have everything else, and yet we're told to set our mind on things above. When it comes to even what's going on here with our country right now, our goal is not to have 
our children live in a, pre, a free country. It is one of the goals. But my goal is that my children would walk with the Lord more so than anything else. And I would say that any of you who have children, your goal is not just that your kids would have a free country to live in, but that your children would walk with the Lord. That's my goal. And so when we set our minds on the things above, what does it mean? How do we act it out in today's society that my mind, my goals are not the goals that this world has. My mind is seeking for things above. Set my mind on things above and where God is. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. It is hidden. It's safe, as I said before. Christ has our life. If we depart from this world, we know where we go. We are secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, when, he, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So therefore, put to death what is, what is earthly in you, sexual morality, impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. And it says, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Put to death these things. These desires that we have that are not of the Lord, but are carnal. Impurity, passions, evil desires, covetousness. These things that are in us that we want. We drive by a nice house, we want that house. Somebody buys a nice car and we say, you know what, I want a nice car too. Or impure thoughts. We think of the phones that we have, the places that we can go, the things that we can see. Put these things away. Evil speaking. Verse 7 says, And those you too once walked when you lived in them, but now you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscure talk from your mouth. These things must be put away. They don't go away by themselves, but we put an effort into it. And so by having these things put away, we renew our mind. As our mind is renewed, we start to understand what the will of God is. In, any, in many areas that it does not clearly show us. And then verse 10 says, And having put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek, no Jew, no circumcised, nor uncircumcised. No barbarian, slave free, both. But Christ is all in, in you all. In Christ... There is no distinction. When we look at God, He is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't say, you know what? I like these groups of people better than those groups of people. As Christians, you and I have no advantage from the person beside you. There's nothing that separates or makes you closer to the Lord than the person that's beside you. There is no distinction. And so we're to put in this new self and have a renewed knowledge after God. In the knowledge, 2 Peter chapter 1 talks about putting on all these things to your faith, add patience, and so on. Let's just turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. Starting in verse 3, it says, Having divine power, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us to His glory and excellence. It's in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ that we have His divine power that is granted to us to live a godly life. It says, By which He has granted to us precious and very great promises, promises so that through them you may become partakers of, of His divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desires. When we walk with the Lord and we are in fellowship with the Lord and we know the Lord, He gives us divine power to overcome temptation. He gives us divine understanding on how to react. I was thinking even of the, the apostles after Christ ascended. They said, who has taught these guys? How do they know this? And they came to one conclusion, they walk with the Lord. Scripture says in Corinthians as well that not many noble are called, not many wise are called, but God has chosen 
to show himself strong among the fools, so to say, at times. Among the weak, he shows himself strong. One John two fifteen and seventeen through seven says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. We all have desires, the desires of the flesh. You know, I want to have the best job and do the least amount of work. I want to eat all the food but not gain any weight, right? I want the best tasting stuff. The desires of the flesh, we all have these things. They're of the world. Or the desire of the eyes. You know what? I want to have the nicest car. Or I like the way that looks. Or I want what that is. Or we have the pride of life that, you know what? I want people to look up to me. At the end of the day, I want people to admire who I am. Look what I can do. Look what I've accomplished. It says, all these things are not from the Father, but are of the world. And it says, the world is passing away with its passions and its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. When we set our minds on these earthly things, we're not in the will of God. And so it's hard to discern then what the will of God is in circumstances that we come across at times. If we're not walking with the Lord and we're not putting our mind on things above if all we're looking at right now, even with what's going on, is what is happening here right now, and we're consuming nothing more but news about what's going on around us, and we're not spending time in the Word of God, and we're not spending time in prayer, how do we expect to discern what the will of God is? We'll get angry, we'll get frustrated, and we'll say all kinds of stuff, but we have no idea what the Lord is doing. And so, as Christians, we first must put our mind on the Lord and seek the things above Ask the Lord for directions. How do I get involved in what's going on in here? So that we're in the will of God. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all with unveiled face behold the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord in, his, in the Spirit. Those of us who are born again says that we behold the face of the Lord from one glory to another. He gives us one insight upon another. I believe in Jeremiah, it says, here little, there little, here insight, there an insight. We don't all grow at once. But as we spend time with the Lord, as we spend time in His Word, in prayer, He gives us insight in how we should even live in this world today with the things that are going on. You know, we know that God is sovereign, even as I said before, His sovereign will. God has placed us here today knowing exactly what was going on, what was going to happen. God placed you in the family that he placed you in for a purpose. He placed you in Ontario in 2022 for a purpose. And so knowing that you are where God wants you, the question is, what does God want us to do now? How do we engage the world around us? Because as Christians, we ought to be engaging the people around us. We ought to be talking to them. Not about what we like or don't like, but definitely about the Lord. Even as Herman said, when we have a strong church, we have a strong community. A church that reaches out impacts the community. And a community that is being impacted will then go forth and impact the country. And so if we want a strong family, a strong church, it begins by setting our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Your mind controls your body, and your will controls your mind. Right? Your mind controls your body. Where your brain says, go, you go. When your brain tells your arm to move, it moves. If not, we have some serious problems. And our will controls what our mind thinks. Many people think they can control the will by willpower, but it doesn't normally work out. Has anybody ever tried in their own willpower to overcome Certain addictions, I know I have. When I was a young Christian, I smoked. And I tried desperately hard to quit for 
probably six months, I would say, you know what, I'll buy a full pack, I'll throw the whole pack away. That'll do it, because I'm throwing money away. It would work for a day, and the next day I'd be right back at it again. I tried my own willpower for a very long time, for at least six months, and it cost me a lot of money and a lot of heartache. I came to a place the one day, I told the Lord, you know what? I can't quit smoking, so you're going to be stuck with the Christian who smokes. I was hiding it from everybody. I said, I'm done. I'm, not, I'm done hiding. I'm done playing this game. I can't do it, and I'm going to smoke the rest of my life, and I don't care. The next day, or within, within a week, my desire for smoking went away. It was a, honestly a miracle to this day. I don't know what happened. Until that day, I tried desperately hard. After I told the Lord, you know what? I can't do it. I'm going to be, I'll be addicted to smoking. It's not my fault. I tried. I've done the best I could, so I thought. And I did. When I gave up, the Lord took it away. You know, I was even thinking, when it comes to our own willpower, we've had children, our oldest, when she was about two, three years old, she had a very strong will. And most of you who've had children probably have had a child that's had a strong will. You try hard to break that will so they would be yielded to the parent. The child struggles. The child is miserable and unhappy with whatever's going on. doesn't matter. But when they yield the will, you see the joy they have. You see the freedom they enjoy. They see or they feel the appreciation the parents has for them. And so it is with us too. When we are refusing to give our will into the Lord, fighting on our own terms, our own ways, it frustrates the grace of God in our lives. Like I said, when I smoked at the time, I'm like, this isn't right. I've got everything available to overcome these things. I know the scriptures. I shouldn't be here, but I was. And when I gave it over to the Lord and said, I can't do it, miraculously, he could. Instantly. Never craved again, which is, like I said, a miracle. It's only when we yield to the will of God that the power can take over and give us the willpower that we need to overcome and be a victorious Christian. Romans chapter 7, verse 15, and onward explains this really well. I'm only going to read verse 15. It says, For I do not understand my own action. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Has anybody ever done that? Right? It's like, what I want to do, I don't do. I want to go and share the gospel, but I don't do it. I want to speak up. I should speak up, but I can't. You find yourself doing things, the very thing that you hate, you're practicing all of a sudden somewhere. And that's the flesh. Unless we're yielded to the will of God completely, we will be stuck in that area where the things that we don't want to do, we find ourselves doing. The things that we want to do, we will not be doing. So to have a right relationship with the Lord must start each day by yielding to Him both our bodies, our minds, and our wills giving everything to him, even as I said before, going to Romans there, to present our bodies a living sacrifice. It's a once and for all thing. It's not something that we do again and again. We give our body to the Lord and say, it's your body. And it's precious. Thinking of the parable Jesus gave, he said there was a man who found this precious jewel in the field. And for the joy of that precious jewel, he sold everything he had. He got rid of his house, he got rid of everything to buy the field. Not because he wanted the land, but because he wanted that precious jewel. It was worth everything to him. And that's what Christ ought to be. He ought to be that precious jewel that we're willing to forsake everything we have to gain that precious jewel. So when it comes to knowing the will of God, there's three things I'd like us to consider on how we can understand the will of God to some degree. First of all, that the will of God is decisively, or is, the will of God of command is revealed with final decisive authority only in the Bible. In other words, the will of God will never contradict the Bible. 
When we seek to know what the will of God is, the Bible has a final answer. The actions that it may want to produce in us when even we think of these rallies is anger at times or frustration. And the Bible says, do nothing out of anger or envy. We ought to be praying for our leaders. We ought to be praying for our government. We ought to be praying for even these protests that they would be done in a way that it would be honoring to God as many of our fellow Christians are involved in there. So first of all, the will that God has set for us will never contradict Scripture. Scripture has a final authority on what God wills for us. Second is that our application, our application to biblical truth in every situation. We apply our lives to what the Bible has given us, clear instructions. Uh, situations that may or may not be explicitly addressed in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell you who you should marry, but it tells you who you should not marry. Right? It doesn't say you should marry this person, but it says you should not marry this person. A believer is not to marry an unbeliever. The Bible's clear on that. The Bible doesn't tell us what kind of car we should drive. It doesn't tell us which way we should go to work. It doesn't tell us whether we should go on vacation or not. It doesn't tell us if we should buy a house or we should rent, where we should buy a house, what we should do. A lot of these things the Bible does not tell us. And there are thousands of decisions, thousands of decisions that we make on a regular basis that the Bible does not give us clear answers. You can't go to the Bible and say, you know what, I should drive a Dodge Caravan. That's why I'm driving one, right? But yet, when we understand the Scripture and we follow the principles of Scripture, it's clear what we should drive. We drive within our means, right? The Scripture gives us clear guidelines how we should live our lives, even though it doesn't say what you should or shouldn't do, who you should marry, who you shouldn't, or it says who you shouldn't marry. And so it's applying these biblical situations to our life. And then the third one is that most of our actions are spontaneous. Look at, your, look at what your life is doing. What's going on in your life? The actions that you do, the majority of these actions that we do are spontaneous. They're just a spillover from what's inside. For instance, God tells us, do not be angry, do not be prideful, do not covet, don't be anxious, don't be jealous, don't envy. None of these actions are premeditated. When you're driving on the 401 or anywhere and somebody cuts you off, you don't say, you know what, hold on, this guy just cut me off. I've been very, I've had really good self-control for the last two weeks. I'm going to actually get angry now. And then I get angry. Anybody do that? Or you see something somebody has, like, you know what, I've been content. I haven't covered anything for two weeks, three weeks. Two years, actually. I'm going to covet this guy's car. Right? Those things you don't think about. Somebody does something, you get angry instantly. It's not something you think about. It's what's in the heart. It's coming out. And so when you look at your life, what is it doing? What is the fruit in your life? Is it one that demonstrates what the Bible calls us to do as Christians? Or is it one that is carnal? When somebody cuts me off, I don't have time to think I'm yelling and screaming and what all, right? Are you constantly envious? Constantly anxious? Constantly not trusting the Lord? Or are these things that are naturally you're doing because you're in the Word of God and you got your mindset on things above? Matthew 12, starting at verse 33. It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure out of his heart brings forth good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you in that day, or in the day of judgment, people will be giving an account for every careless word they speak. You ever think of those things when you're hanging out with your friends? Every word you have no need to say and you have to give an account for one day. 
right? When you look at some of these truths, they're convicting. Like I said, many of these actions that we do are a spillover of what's in the heart. And so you want to know where you stand with the Lord. Examine your life and be honest. Say, what am I doing? When I hang out with my friends, what do I say? When somebody does something that I wasn't expecting, do I get angry and frustrated right away? Does my life demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering. Or am I the opposite? If that's what you're doing, you can be sure of one thing. Your mind is set on things of the flesh, not on things above. God is patient. God is long-suffering. And so when we want to know what the will of God is in these circumstances, we need to be in the Word of God. We need our minds to be controlled and need our bodies and our will to be yielded to the Lord so that as we engage people around us, as we share things, that these are things that are true and that are right, that are pleasing to the Lord. In closing, I'm just going to read Romans 12, 1 and 2 again. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So as we go, even as we engage people today, whether it's our brothers and sisters in Christ, our families, let's be intentional. Let's build one another up, encouraging one another to seek the Lord, to spend time with the Lord. And as we look at how to engage our government be in prayer. I believe we ought to be engaged in the government, but we ought to do it in a way that Christ is honored and glorified. And so, ask the Lord, what should I do? If you want to know the will of God, you need to be in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to make that of utmost importance. Seek the Lord. Ask Him, what would you have me do? Why did you place me in Canada in 2022? Yeah, 2022. Right? Why? Why here? And how do I, as a father, as a mother, as a child, engage the people around me for the good of this country and for the good of the Lord? With that, let's just close in prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, we thank you again for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we ask that you give us wisdom and discernment in how we can engage our fellow men. Help us to know what your will is in this situation, not just in this situation, but in every situation, that we could be salt and light to those around us. Help us to be wise and yet to be harmless. And Lord, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.